Guys, the title sponsor of my podcast is GoHunt.com Insider, and they're doing a 30-day free trial exclusive for the J. Scott Outdoors podcast listeners. Go to GoHunt.com forward slash J. Scott and click on the blue free trial button and go through the steps. It only takes a couple of minutes. You will be required to provide a credit card, but you will not be charged until after the free 30 days. You can cancel at any time within the first 30 days to prevent being charged. If you have any questions at all, you can email freetrial at gohunt.com and someone from the GoHunt team will promptly respond. This is your opportunity to see what all the buzz is about and the filtering 2.0 system and the application strategies for the Western Hunter. Welcome to the J. Scott Outdoors podcast. Today we've got the founder and president of Kuyu, Jason Harrison, on the line. Jason, how you doing? I'm doing good, Jay. How have you been? Uh, I've been pretty awesome. I've been watching uh, your your adventures on Instagram, <laughs> and it looks like you just shot a monster blacktail in California. That didn't take long. No, what a! I mean, I'm just stoked about that buck. It's I call it a a lifetime achievement award having grown up in California and having the chance to hunt and kill a buck like that. I've, that's the biggest black tail I've seen on the ground, you know, personally hunting, um, and let alone to, to have a chance to take him was, was awesome. And I did it with my son with me, which made it even that much more special. Yeah. I saw some pictures on your Instagram with cash and just looked like you guys had a, a heck of a time. Uh, what was it like, you know, being a black tail hunter in California and you know, quite honestly, you know, blacktail in California, it's tough. And then seeing a buck like this, uh, was it just like uh, one of those cartoon commercials when your eyeballs <laughs> just pop out of your head? Well, kind of. I mean, I I uh, met a guy, um, Dylan Carr, who owns Diamond Sea Ranch a couple of years ago at SCI. And he came up to me and introduced himself and started showing me these, bu- these blacktails that he has on his ranch that he hunts. And we got talking and I booked a hunt with him. So, I uh, kind of up my odds as far as finding something big. And then Dylan's just really, really an amazing guy. I mean, he is just a blacktail fanatic and has had that property for 15 years and has really put an amazing management program together where he's letting these bucks, the really good genetic bucks, get mature and to breed and then you know, really working on pulling the bad genetics out. And after 15 years of hard work, and commitment to this program, he's starting to produce some just world-class blacktails. And uh, so I had the opportunity to go up and hunt with him. And he's on what they call a, a partners and wildlife program through the fishing game where he can set up his own management on the on the property here in California and then set up kind of his own seasons. And uh, it's a rare opportunity to be able to hunt blacktails in the velvet with a rifle, which his program allows him to do. So um, to be able to go up there and hunt that ranch with them and see the caliber of bucks that, that are on that place was just breathtaking to me having grown up here and to see that there's truly black tails that can get that big if they're able to get to the, the right age with the right genetics was just awesome. Um, but we, we kind of did have a tough hunt. We had really, really hot weather. I mean, it was like 107 degrees the day we were hunting. And so we were seeing a fraction of the bucks that he'd been seeing just a few days before in the cooler weather. And we'd found the buck that I hunted that morning. We were looking for a non-typical buck that he had seen the day before. We just couldn't find him, and we happened to catch this buck in his bed kind of kind of mid-morning, right before he was getting into the shade to bed down. And we made a stock on him, but he got kind of through an opening where I had a, a chance to get a shot. I just wasn't set up yet and had to let him go, and they bedded. And then we went and looked for that non-typical buck that evening and came back to see if we could find this buck getting out of his bed, which we did, and I was able to... Um, make it you know, like a 275 yard shot on him right at dark and, and got it done. And, uh, yeah, I was just thrilled and never really got a good look at him when he was, when he was on his feet. And, uh, I kind of got, I saw him when he got up in the morning of the bed and kind of was going through the grass, but I really hadn't been able to put a, put a size on the frame. And we walked up on him. I was just blown away. So he's, he's 18 inches tall for a black tail. That's, that's, that's just amazing. And he doesn't have, you know, the deep forks to score well, um, but he still grosses 137 just on his frame, which is which wow. is really a really solid buck. I mean, it's over Boone and Crockett on the gross. So, yeah, I was I was pumped. Pretty sweet. Uh, yeah. Was that the first hunt that Cash had actually been with you um, on a hunt, or has Cash, your son, been on other hunts with you? No, he started, uh, he started hunting with me when he was like two and a half. And I think the very first hunt I ever took him on was a, was a hog hunt on a ranch. And 
I spotted this big boar coming down to this grain field right at dark, and I threw him on my back and literally piggybacked down this ditch with him and had this pig coming down this, this boar, big boar coming down this fence line, and I swung him off my back and set him next to me. And I peek up over the edge of this, this, this ditch, and I can see the boar coming right to the fence. I'm like, Cash, don't move. You're going to see the most amazing thing you've ever seen before. And this boar walked by at 12 yards, and I shot him with a longbow right through the heart. It ran about 20 yards and fell over, and he just turned to me and looked at me. It's like, Dad, I love you, and just hugged me. That was our very first hunt together. And he's been, like, hooked. And he's like my good luck charm. Every time I take him, we have always have a successful hunt. It's amazing. That's awesome. I just, yeah, that I just took him to Alaska. Awesome. I don't know if you saw those pictures. And uh, he shot his first black bear with his 243. And I was just so proud of him. I mean, this bear, we spotted the bear on the bait that morning and snuck in because we were trying to get into a stand. And we couldn't get a clear shot on the bear because the grass was too tall for him because he's so little. And uh, we let the bear feed off. And we climbed up in the stand and we waited. And the bear came back in, which surprised me. But Cash didn't like the kind of quartering two angles, so he's like, "Dad, I'm going to let him. T- I'm going to wait till he gets broadside. I'm not taking the shot." And so he let the bear feed off, which I couldn't believe. <laughs> and he goes, he looks at me, he's like, "Don't worry, Dad, he'll be back." And about 15, 20 minutes later, he showed back up, and he waited till he had the perfect broadside shot, leg forward, and then just made a perfect shot. The bear went right down. I was just like, "Man, that was so cool." I, and I was you know, way I, more nervous. I was way more nervous than he was. Yeah, I'm sure. I mean, you just wanted him to do so good and enjoy, you know, what you enjoy. It uh, definitely brings out totally different emotions. Um, that's awesome. And I do remember seeing those pictures on Instagram. And I, I think your smile was ever bit as big as uh-huh. his. It was pretty pretty cool uh-huh. to see that. Yeah, now I know why my dad liked to t- take me so much. I mean, I get more out of it, I think, than he does. That's awesome. That is that's awesome. Cool well, stuff. you've got the... You've got a great adventure in front of you. Uh, tell me, I think you're headed to the Yukon. Tell me what's going on uh, here with your next hunt. Yeah, I'm heading up to the Yukon. I'm hunting with a bonnet plume. Brendan's coming with me. We're bringing a videographer. We're bringing Paul Bride, and we're going to shoot a documentary film on this on this hunt. It's a it's going to be a really unique setup. Uh, we went and talked to Chris McKenna, who owns that area, and it's it's bonnet plume sits in the north. It's the northern eastmost. Uh, territory, hunting territory up there, and it sits right next to Arctic Red that's in the Northwest Territory, so it's really far north. And then he's got a mountain range in there that's really hard to get into. I think he's been into it once or twice before over all the years he's had the area, and it's it's kind of a logistical nightmare. We have to, uh, we're going to fly into base camp uh, next Tuesday on the 9th of August, and then we'll, from base camp, we'll su- if the weather permits, we'll super cub into a river where we'll then unload our gear and get into a jet boat that he several years ago drove in from the Mackenzie river. I think it took him like eight days to get it in. And then there isn't a strip to access this mountain range. We have to take this jet boat up this river. I don't know how many miles it's it's quite a ways to access this mountain range. That's, I guess is very rugged, very remote. And he was flying past it a year or two ago and, and saw a couple of really big rams on it and has been wanting to get a client that actually could hunt it and, and deal with the logistical challenges and the ruggedness of this mountain range. And obviously, you know, we always are kind of the guinea pigs for that stuff because I love it. And I'm like, ah, let's go check that place out. And so we're going to go go in and, and explore and then see if we can build a strip to get out or, or we'll take the boat back out to get out. So it's going to be quite the adventure. We'll be in there for 10 full days of hunting and then a, a couple days of, of travel in and out of there. So I, I'm really, really excited about it. Wow, that's going to be an incredible adventure. Uh, perfect for you and Brendan and Paul. Uh, I really got to like uh, Paul. He came down on that Mexico coos deer hunt with you guys, and uh, he's just an amazing uh, videographer and photographer. He just has an unbelievable uh, eye for that. So that that should be an epic adventure. Yeah, I mean, Paul's Paul's as good as they get as far as outdoor photography. Yeah, he's he just won some huge like worldwide award last year and he's been nominated for another giant award that i think i'll find out whether he wins it or not this fall uh he's the stuff he shoots for arcteryx is just breathtaking and uh you know it's just amazing that i have the opportunity to work with him on all of our hunts and he'd never hunted before i took him on his first hunt up in northwest territories it broke him in on a sheep hunt of all things to break him in on and he just absolutely loves it he can't get enough of it and it's always like when are we going next I want to go shoot some shots and uh, to watch him do his thing is, is truly, truly art happening right in front of you. He's just, he's so amazing to do, to watch him see something 
and shoot it and capture it. And it's just, it's, it's really, really fun to work with him. Yeah. I thought one of the cool things was, um, you know, he's, he's, he's intense and you can tell he's really good at what he does. And there were several times when, I, you know, he shot a couple shots and I'm like, do you need to do it again? And he's like, Nope, I got it. And I'm thinking, yep. goodness, he just knows that he, he's got the shot. He's that good. It was amazing totally. to be around him. Well, it's um, so funny. I'll spend all day with him in the mountains, right? And I'm like, Hey Paul, should we shoot this? And he'll just look at me and shake his head. And I'll see something like <laughs> this, and he just shakes his head. And we might spend all day out there, right? And all of a sudden, he'll go, get your stuff. We got two minutes. And it's like on. And then Paul will shoot yeah. like 10 or 15 shots. He'll turn and look at me. He's all like, I'm done. And go do your thing, right? And then yeah. he might not say that again for another 24 hours. He just He doesn't just go shoot to shoot. And he shoots very limited amounts throughout the day. Because unless he can see it all line up and how he sees things, it's so different than everybody else, he won't shoot it. It's really an amazing thing to watch him do his thing. Yeah, pretty cool. I've been Super following cool. you on Instagram, and uh, you've really uh, – I haven't seen you in person probably since the Western Hunting Expo. Uh, but your face, you, you look lean. You, I've been following <laughs> you on Instagram, and you've been really hiking. I want to talk to you a little bit. And I know the listeners kind of want to hear uh, sure. how you've been prepping for these hunts. And, you know, let's talk a little bit about diet and nutrition and, and just your whole preparation sure. for, this, for this hunt. Well, growing up, in, you know, I grew up as an athlete, played, played college and professional football. So training has always been something I just really enjoy. It's always been my kind of mental outlet. I know you do, too. And from your athletic days. And so, you know, I'm always experimenting with different ways to prepare for a hunt. And as we get older, I mean, I'm, you know, I just turned 45 years old, and you know, my goal is always to be able to keep up with the guides, you know, mentally and physically. And it gets harder as we get older, as you know. I mean, you have to just put in more dedication to it and spend more time doing it. And then also really manage your body. I mean, I can, I have the tendency to overtrain, and I've done it um, several years where I get, you know, cardiovascularly in such good shape that I'll actually get a tendonitis or pull something before I get into a hunt and have to manage through that. And it's, so I'm always kind of adjusting things, managing things. And then last year in the Hani, when I shot that big, huge uh, broomed ram that day, I had going into that hunt a very, very, probably the most stressful period I've ever had in my life. I, you know, my mom passed away, my grandmother passed away, and, and my mom passed away in April, my, my grandmother passed away in May, I was trying to get bank financing closed for Kuyu, and it was a really stressful time leading right up to that hunt, and the day I killed that ram, I bonked as bad as I've ever bonked, I mean, I came out of that mountain, and was literally could walk only at half speed, and the guides are like, hey, Jason, you know, we'll take the meat, we'll take the cape and horns, but I, I will, will always pack out my animal, and I was just... I got thumped and suffered and, and made it back to camp. And then when I came out of that hunt, I'm like, okay, I'm going to never let that happen again because uh, it's such an awful experience. It's happened to me a few times. And so I really kind of tweaked my diet this whole off season and, and off year and really tweaked my training and started er much earlier this year training in a heavy pack and doing you know a lot of um, long cardio in a heavy pack. And then mixing in some interval training on sprints and hill sprints and then also interval training with a pack on. And yeah, my, I've uh, probably down 10 to 12 pounds from where I started earlier this year and also um, have really focused on just big, long cardio, a lot of time and working on my biomechanics with my pack and my boots and equipment just to um, see where I could get this year for this hunt, knowing what the type of trip we were going on and how rugged it was going to be. And, and just really making sure that I built a really solid platform of, of cardiovascular fitness and muscle fitness going into this thing. And uh, I don't know if I've ever been in this good of shape going into hunt. That's great. I can't wait to hear how, how it all goes for you. Um, when it comes to, you said you're changing your diet um, are we talking amounts of food, types of food? Yeah. Uh, yeah maybe no, run through kind of what you're doing. Sure. Um, I really kind of gotten into a, a paleo, more paleo focused diet and high fat diet away from staying away from sugars, which, you know, is kind of the thing to do now and, and allow yourself and teaching your body to burn its own fat and to burn fat is much more efficient. It doesn't burn as fast and as hot as sugar, which can lead you to bonk. And so that's been, that's been my focus, higher, you know, more rich fatty foods. Um, 
and you know obviously a very clean diet but then you know staying away from any higher higher sugar type of things um and i think that's been a lot to do with you know the fat burning then also in my training i won't bring any food so i might do a three and a half hour hike and i won't eat on the on the hike just to just to force my body to uh to burn fat and to be used to not having uh food in its system you know in my system to get through a you know a 10 mile 12 mile hike like i did the other day and it's made a big difference, but it's also leaned me out big time. Yeah, for sure. Um, I've kind of been doing the same thing uh, this whole summer since we got up here in Colorado, May 21st. I've kind of basically changed my whole diet. And uh, my wife and I have been getting in between 5 and 10 miles uh, every day up here at elevation, you know, anywhere from yep. seven to 10,000 feet. And, uh, you know, hiking with a pack, it, it it's really changed um, my endurance level. Um, it's gotten better. Um, I probably haven't carried as much weight uh, as as I should have been carrying. Uh, I, my elk hunt uh, here starts uh, another three weeks or so. Um, but I, I've really uh, gotten to kind of lean out a little bit and really enjoy hiking it at elevation. Um, yeah. And... You know, you're in California, and for those listeners that, you know, don't have the ability to train at altitude, you know, what kind of advice can you give, you know, do you you train uh, certain times of the day to try and, you know, simulate harder, uh, you know, uh, a harder environment for your body, or, or, you know, since you don't have the ability to train at seven or eight, nine, ten thousand feet, what do you do? Well, I've went and did a VO2 max study last year, you know, studying uh, pack weight and how it impacted VO2 max um, and how quickly, how much, you know, 10 pounds or 20 pounds in a pack would have you max. And when I was working with the sports science lab in Davis, we really started talking about interval training, which I had done in the past, but it's something that he really kind of opened my eyes up to and, you know, really getting into doing at least one set of intervals a week um, or even better to do two sets of intervals a week to really spike that heart rate. And to really, that'll really build a strong base, which will help you in those higher altitudes and lower your overall resting heart rate and really increase your level of, of your heart rate at the max. And to me, that's, that's kind of step one is, is to mix in at least intervals once a week, which I do. And as I'm approaching hunting season, I'm doing intervals twice a week and then doing one big, big day a week in a pack. And I started off this year as kind of funny. I, we have these black kind of uh, sandbags that are set up for putting over light booms and, and sound booms in our videography room. And they were great for loading up your pack with weight. And they come in various amounts of weight. And I thought I had the 20-pound bags, and I put three of them in my pack. Well, I had, gra- I had grabbed um, two 25-pounders and a 30-pounder and put it in my pack, thinking that was 60 pounds. I said it was... <laughs> Instead, it was 80 pounds plus water plus the pack. Well, I was training with 90 pounds thinking it was like 65 <laughs> and wow. had done that for like a month and a half. And I remember the first time out and I was like, God, I'm getting old. This thing feels so freaking heavy. But then I got used to it and I was training with Dallas one day and he opened my pack up to just see what I had. He's like, you know, you have 80 pounds in here. I'm like, no, I don't. I've got 60. And he's like, no, this is 80 pounds. And so... It was the first year I've ever trained with a pack that heavy. And I tell you what, it, it's made such a massive difference. Um, once I got through the soreness, I'm glad I got used to carrying that weight. Uh, the other day I dropped down to 60 just as I'm tapering for this hunt and did a, uh, what did I do, like 11 mile loop. And I mean, it was 60 pounds. I felt like I could run because I'm so used to training <laughs> That's at 90. Awesome. And I, I think that, you know, increased weight. And then I was also doing some, some training right in the middle of the day, like at two o'clock here in California on really hot days. And just as a way to um, really make you suffer, and a lot of it's the mental toughness, right? You can get through it, and you're dying, and it's hot, and it's miserable, and you train in that. And then when you get nice, cool environments, even the altitude, it allows you mentally just to get through it um, because you put the work in in advance, you know. For sure. Let's take a quick break here. Real Game Calls featuring the Elk Reel.
Real Game Calls makes innovative, realistic, and easy-to-master calls using their proprietary, revolutionary design. They are located and manufactured in Gypsum, Colorado. Their calls were designed and battle-tested on some of the hardest-hunted terrain on Earth. Check out ElkReel.com. Use the promo code JSCOTT and receive a 20% discount on all purchases. Go to www.elkreel.com. Phonescope is a company that makes custom-molded, precisely engineered smartphone digiscoping adapters. Photographing wildlife has never been easier. It is simple to text photos and videos from your smartphone and share them with your friends. Phonescope stands behind their product with a 100% money-back guarantee. Get yours now by using the JSCOTT16 promo code and receive 10% discount on all purchases. Check them out at Phonescope, that's P-H-O-N-E-S-K-O-P-E dot com, or on Instagram, at Phonescope. All right, Jason, uh, I want to talk to you a little bit about your kit and um, for this uh, Yukon hunt that you're going on and how you've come up with this kit that you're taking and, and all the ins and outs of it, please. Sure. I mean, it's something that I focus on and it always starts with a gear list and it's a gear list that I'm constantly refining and something I do um, every time before a trip is I'll break it down to an Excel spreadsheet. It has all the weights and as I'm adding things and taking things away, I can really dial in exactly what I have. And then when I'm traveling home, I always, on the flight home, I always pull up that gear list and go back through it and I'll make notes about you know what I used, what I didn't use, what worked well, what didn't work well comments and ideas of what I might change for the next year, whether it's food, whether it's kit and equipment. So after this many years, it, it's pretty dialed. And for this upcoming trip, um, I've got to pack kit weights before optics. So that's before the spotting scope, the tripod, and before food and my rifle, that is just under 10 pounds. And that includes everything else, which is my sleeping pad, my sleeping bag, my tent, uh, my extra clothes, any extra, you know, my, my headlamp, my extra headlamp, backup stuff, emergency kit, um, any other personal items I might need or have for the trip. And I've gotten it paired that far down to where um, when I add in my food, which I weigh, and my food will be just under two pounds a day on this trip. That's what my food food weight will be, and we'll be in for 10 days. So that's um, you know, that's just under 20 pounds and then add my five, pound, my five and a half pound rifle and some shells. And then, you know, the optics are heavy. My, I think my tripod and spider scope's eight pounds. So I'll end up right around 40 pounds for a 10 day hunt. Okay. 40 pounds. Um, and what have you, what gear as far as Kuyu, um, let's, let's just talk about what you're going to be wearing, sure. um, in, and then what additional Kuyu, uh, you know, clothing and such do you carry in the pack uh, for sure. backup and such? Yeah, it's not, I don't bring a lot of backup. Um, so I'll bring a, you know, a set of base air merinos are, are 145 zip off bottoms. We'll do a 125 crew tee. And then I'll bring a 145 merino, ultra merino zip tee. And those are two base layers, you know, one so I can interchange uh, from one to the next if one's soaked from coming in that night or if one just starts to get to where I feel like I need to change it for hygiene reasons and I can't get to a river to wash it out. Um, or I can add that zip tee over the top of that if I want to add more merino layers if it gets cold. And then I will bring our 210 ho- or 200 gram Peloton hoodie, which is one of my favorite pieces. And then I'll bring a super down and my shell. And then I'll be on this trip running our attack pants and then I'm running our two gatch rain gear. And that's my kit. It's not much. I don't bring a backup set of pants. I don't bring, you know, anything like that. And I bring an extra pair of socks. So I interchange socks daily. And I'm using our Ultramarino socks. And then I bring our guide gloves. And for a trip like that, that's all I need as far as apparel. Um, I'll bring a, a glassing, our glassing cap and our Merino neck gaiter. Um, and that's all I have as far as my, in my apparel system. And then for my sleeping system, I use our short air mattress, Thermarest X-Lite. 
that's seven ounces, and I'll throw my pack down at the feet, you know, down at my feet, and use that to get my feet off the ground. And then I'm running our our two P Mountain Star tent, which is just over three pounds. And then for you know for food, um, you know, I've got it broken down to a dehydrated skillet breakfast. I like the eggs and the potatoes. It's one of those breakfasts that stays with you for a while. And then during the day, I I bring real food. I bring I'll bring almonds, I'll bring bagels, I'll bring, um, you know, some salami and cheese to make a sandwich out of the bagel and try to stay away from high sugar, you know, performance bars. I've just gotten away from that type of food, more whole type of foods I'll eat throughout the day. And then a, a dehydrated mountain house dinner and that those food bags I prep in advance. So I've got a food bag set up for every day. And I just reach in and grab it and replace the old one. And those, you know, all my food for the day will come in just shy of two pounds a day for as a rule of thumb. And I try to get that calories per ounce over 110 calories per ounce as far as the food choices. And that gets me about 3,500 calories a day, which, you know, you're never going to make up what you lose during a day on a, on a hunt like that. But it's enough I found to get me through and not just be starving the whole time or bonk. And then it's my, you know, it's my Swaro 65 millimeter spotting scope, my Manfrotto carbon fiber tripod, my Boswell titanium action gun that's that's incredibly light, and my Swarovski binoculars and a binocular harness. So it's there's not a lot of kit that I bring. I noticed um, on Instagram last night you post that you and Sean were messing around with uh, the bino harness and. Uh, potentially a rangefinder pouch. Yep. Uh, what, can, what can you tell me about that? Yeah, we're, we're always experimenting with new stuff in there. And, you know, go, in bear country, one of the things I've never really been totally happy with is how we've carried a rifle. And, you know, I can drop my pack and get my rifle out of our current rifle carrying system really quickly. It's fine. It works great. It holds a rifle in a great position. But to access it, you know, incredibly quickly, like in an emergency, if you come across a bear doesn't lend itself to getting out super super fast and so i started playing around with this concept of mounting it to our hip belt and then having a way which we did but then you couldn't get the butt of the gun out fast enough it kind of hang up in it so we put a quick clip like a belt buckle that we use on our on our hip belts so you just reach down and, and hit that clip and it drops the butt of the gun right off and you can just slide it out from the pack and it, it works great so i'm going to be testing that um, on our current bio bino harness i put we put loop on the bottom of it, and then using Velcro, I, I sewed on hook onto some bullet loops so we can actually have and hold bullets, um, extra spare bullets on the bottom side of our bi current bino harness, um, which will be interesting to test that out. It's a great location for them. And then we've been cooking around a bunch of different concepts you know, for the last year on creating a a pouch that would attach well to our current bino harness to carry a, a range of sizes of, of range finders. And I think Sean has probably six different concepts in the development room right now. The one I took a picture of is kind of my favorite because it's just a little baby brother of our current bino harness um, where you just fold that down and grab the, the range finder out. I think it's a little bit wide still. We've got to narrow it down a little bit, it looks like, but I think functionally it's it's pretty, it's a really cool concept. So, uh, we'll be testing those different rangefinder concepts out this fall and have something out this spring, whichever one turns out to be the best or the combination of several that we figure out to be the best way to do that. You know, one thing I, I hear all of what you're saying, one thing that I think is so interesting about the way that you do business with being transparent with your customers is here you are posting pictures of ideas that you have and you're getting feedback from people on your Instagram account, That that's mind-blowing to me that someone that's in your position that has a super successful company, I was just wondering if you could speak to one from a uh, competitive advantage of being transparent at sometimes uh, maybe the cat gets let out of the bag a little bit, um, and maybe you could talk a little bit about that aspect and compare it to uh, when when you actually can talk directly with your customer. And I think it goes right back into your business model of you know uh, directly selling to your customer. Um, I'm just curious about your thoughts on that. You know, it's 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 been an amazing process building Kuyu, having built Sitka 
and and built a company that way using you know the retailers to take your product to market. You're really limited on when you could release the product information. You know, Cabela's always wanted to be first to release, and you always had to respect that relationship. And also, we just you know a lot of the stuff we made. I mean, I didn't want to tell people where our fabrics came. You know, they came out of Taiwan, and there's nothing special about a lot of the materials going into our products other than we we're getting a good price on them. And when we created Koo, I thought, God, wouldn't it be cool if everybody could see all the cool stuff I get to work with and the people I get to work with and the places I get to go. And that started really with a blog, as you know, Jay, back in the day when I first started the company. Um, what's great about Instagram for me versus the blog is it can be short posts and quick posts and like what's happening right now. I can post it up without having to have creating a blog post, which typically right. takes a lot of time and you got to write a lot. Where today with Instagram is so fun because I'm like, oh, check this out. Oh, I got to show everybody, right? And yeah. what I've learned through that process, instead of hiding it and then saying, okay, everybody, check this out. What I created is, and you hope they like it, is to show them early and, and get them involved and let them make comments and um, let them you know, see what I'm doing. And it just builds so much trust. And it's really cool. It's fun. I mean, I love to see our customers' feedback. I love to show them, like you saw, I think you commented on or reposted my video from Scarpa. I mean, check this out. I'm an Italian, the leading Italian bootmaker in the world. And I'm in there developing new boots and we're in production. I mean, this is stuff that I think is so cool that I just want to share it. And why hide it? Everyone hides it. I'm like, this is the coolest thing in the world. My job, I have the coolest job in the world. And I just I just love to show people what I'm doing because, I, I mean, I'm fascinated by it. I get pinch myself every day. I come in here. It's like, God, I just want to show everybody what I get to do every day because it's so freaking cool. And the stuff we get to make and create and um, I don't know. Why hide it? Everyone tell you know, I've had people go, God, you tell your competition everything you're doing well before you do it. I'm like, yeah, but they can't do anything about that. They sell to retailers. They're stuck in that model. They can't compete with me. And besides, why hide it from my customers? Yeah, that's a that's a perfect answer right there, and it just makes me smile. I got a big smile on my face right now just listening to your answer. <laughs> I I want to bounce back to a couple things that sure. you had said. I want to get a couple tips from you. Yeah. If you're taking two pair of the of the Kuyu sock, one that you're wearing and an extra pair. What do you do when, say, you've worn the pair you wear in on the trip, wear it for a couple days, or do you switch them every day? And if you have a nearby stream, do you wash them or do you just air them out? What do you do with your socks? What do you do with, uh, you know, any extra shirt? Are you just letting them air or are you actually trying to wash them? You know, I typically don't wash. Um, our merino wool is so good. And as you know, the carotene protein that makes up merino wool is antimicrobial. I mean, I've been in the same shirt for an entire 14-day sheep hunt and never felt like it was disgusting or they got so ripe or so bad that I couldn't wear it. Now, I will, my socks, I switch out every day. And I'll take the pair that I wore that day or a shirt that's really sweaty um, if I did a big day, and I'll switch that out with my spare merino shirt. And then I'd put them at the bottom of my sleeping bag, which you probably do as well. And as you know, if you put your socks, anything wet, from a wet day and you put it in the bottom of your sleeping bag and you wake up in the morning, it'll be dry. The moisture will come out of it because of your, your body heat in, in the sleeping bag. Um, and so that's what I do every day. And I always switch socks every day. So I have a fresh dry pair of my feet going in. And, um, but I usually don't end up washing if it's hot and I'm really sweaty and there's a stream, I might, you know, go in and rinse my stuff off and wring it out and hang it up to dry. But a lot of those sheep hunts, you're just never in camp. So you don't have the chance to do that. And you can't leave it out all day because the storm comes up and it rains or if the wind comes up and blows it away, uh, you can't afford to lose the gear. So that's usually what I'm, what I'm doing. Okay. Um, I noticed you said you're taking the Chugach rain gear and not the ultra NX, mm -hmm. uh, rain gear. Um, is that just a, from a durability, a little bit more durable when you're going to really be beating the brush? That's exactly it. I mean, the, I really built the ultra NX for elk hunting and for lower 48 stuff or desert sheep hunting or drier climate hunts where you're carrying the rain gear more, way more than you're ever in it. And when you're on a sheep hunt up north, you're going to be in rain gear every day um, most of the time. And you could be busting brush. You may be in your rain pants busting brush. And you just need more durability and more reliability to, you know, be, you know, because of the situations you're in. So that's why I'm running Chugach. Okay. And if you know that your day, uh, you know, you're going to be in a drizzle all day, you know, you're going to be in your Chugach rain pants, but it's warm, Jason, do you 
Um, do you ever just wear the Chugach rain pants as basically just over your skin and, and All just the time. roll with it like that? Okay. Yeah, I mean, with our zip-off merino bottoms now, or a Peloton zip-off bottoms now, absolutely. In fact, if I wake up and it's not sunny, warm weather, a lot of times I won't even put on my attack pants, especially if we're um, going to be moving a lot that day and just go on my Chugach and just zip down if I get warm to ventilate. It works really, really well. In fact, like... Lance, Kronberger, and a lot of those Alaskan guides, they're just in our Yukon pants, why I built them. They just, that's the only pant they run. If I was hunting in wetter climates, if I was hunting Alaska, I wouldn't even bring the attack pant. I would just be in our Yukon pant the entire time in my only pant. I've done that on several sheep hunts, and it okay. works phenomenally well. And a lot of that stuff, like in Alaska um, or in wet, you know, st- you can't even sit down unless you have your anger on because everything's wet. And so you might as well just live in it. Okay, that makes sense. And and guys uh, ask me all the time the difference between the Chugach and the Yukon. Um, I have the Chugach and the Ultra NX. I don't have the Yukon. Um, but from what I understand, the Yukon is just a heavy, even heavier duty material than the Chugach. And it's, you know, for brush, you know, going through alders and down on your knees, you know, um, caping out brown bears and, and what have mm-hmm. you. Um, is, is that a pretty good explanation of, of, yeah, of the it is. Con? Yeah. I mean, I built it for guides and guys that were spending 200 days a year in the field up North and they were in their rain gear every single day and they just needed something more durable. So we, we use the same fabric that we use for our gaiters for that rain gear. It stretches, um, it breathes incredibly well and it's really durable. And then because of the thought of how it's going to be used, we, you know, did reinforced knees with Kevlar in the fabric on the knees and the cuffs and the butt is double reinforced and glued. So it's incredibly durable that way. And then we set up the pant like a normal pant. It has cargo pockets. It has hand pockets and it still has a full side leg zip so you can get in and out of it like rain gear, but it's set up like a true hunting pant that's waterproof and breathable. And then the jacket's the same material. And we put a really robust kind of, it's a rubber cuff. So you can cinch that thing really tight to your wrists and keep from water migration coming up your wrists when you're in those Alaskan climates where it's just freaking pouring all day and you just need that level of protection. That's good stuff. Um, I can see like the Ultra NX um, is, is, is the rain gear that you could keep in your pack all the time and it's lighter than the Chugach and you know the, the Chugach for me is unbelievable because of the four-way stretch uh, the Ultra NX is just a lighter version of that. But the thing I like about that is you can always have it in your pack. You don't have to, it, it virtually weighs nothing, the, the, yep. the jacket and the pants. Um, and then, you know, like this elk hunt that I'm going on in Utah, in the event that, you know, a thunderstorm rolls in, I pop it out. And, and um, then when the, it stops raining, you know, I throw it back in the pack and I don't even know it's there. Yeah, I mean, the jacket and pant of Ultra Next weighs less than the two guys' jacket. I think it's yeah, like it's, three ounces less. I mean, it's, it's, it's quite great. a bit. And it's a true, what's great about Ultra Next, it's got that Tory nylon face, so it's really durable for how light it is. Um, and it packs down to nothing. It's, and it's a three layer. It's not a, just a two and a half layer like a lot of companies run to get that weight out of their rain gear, which gives up durability and performance. You know, we're running, Ultra Next is a true three layer fabric, which is, makes it the lightest three layer rain gear in the world. I have known the owners of the Outdoorsman's in Phoenix for over 20 years. They are the authority on optics and hunting gear. Outdoorsman's is the leading designer and manufacturer of high-quality tripods, mounting accessories, and pack systems for all hunters. Their customer service is the best in the business. Go to Outdoorsman's.com or call 1-800-291-8065 and use the J. Scott promo code to receive 10% off any products. Utah Hydrographics is in the water transfer printing service and they can dip almost anything into a wide range of camel patterns, designs, and colors. Whether it's guns, bows, tools, rifle stocks, vehicle parts, steering wheels, cups, or tripods, Utah Hydrographics loves taking things that are general looking and turn them into something that looks fantastic. Give them a call and see what they can do for you and receive up to a 10% discount by using the J. Scott 16 promo code. Visit them at utahhydrographics.com or on Instagram at utahhydrographics. Prior to this episode, we or 
before we got on the air, uh, we were talking about uh, what it meant to go on a hunt. And we talked a little bit about in the intro with, uh, with your son. Uh, how important is it to you as he grows up um, for him? You know, you were in athletics. He's probably going to want to be in athletics. He's probably going to want to be in hunting. I wanted to ask you a question about, you know, family aspect in that you've been successful in most everything that you've done. How important it is as a parent? It's kind of a weird question. It's not really hunting related, but when you're raising your kids and you've been successful, how do you think you bring your kids up, uh, you know, having them seen you successful in a lot of this stuff? How does that weigh in? Well, I think as a, you know, first of all, I want my kids to be happy. If he, if Cash or my daughter wants to hunt because they like to hunt and they enjoy it, awesome. If they want to do something different that makes them happy, I'm supportive a thousand percent. I, I, you know, I grew up in a divorced family and really kind of a tough love father. And, you know, when I was younger, I played football to really get my dad's approval and to want him to like me more, not because I necessarily loved football. And so, uh, and I learned a lot. I learned a big lesson from that. And you know, my true passion, love, has always been the mountains, and it's always been hunting. And I finally, you know, built a career around that. But for me, my what I'm trying to do with my with both my kids, Cash and Coco, is is to let them experience certain things, um, and the things that they really are attracted to and have an interest in, to give them more opportunities around that to explore it. And then, you know, the other things I really try to instill on them are, are the lessons I've learned in life that have allowed me to be successful. And really, that's that's just fundamentals of the things you have to do to have the success. And that's what I try to instill on Cash and I try to instill on Coco is like, if you are going to be doing something, whether it's a sport or activity, let's focus on all the little things that you have to do to be great at that activity. And if you focus on those little things, no matter what it is, every single day, you will eventually get the results you want if you do those things. If you just want to be great, but you don't want to do the small things to get there, then you really can't, unless you're just born with some super amazing talent, you're probably not going to get there. Um, so my goal with these kids, with my, my kids is, is kind of teaching them those fundamental life lessons that I think are so important, whether it's school, whether it's sports, whether it's hunting, or whether it's just things in life um, is really my focus with them and to make sure they're doing something they truly love and, and, and truly enjoy and have a passion for, not for me, not yeah, for I what I want them to be and sure. for what they want to be. And I think that's see so many parents that try to live vicariously through their kids and I just feel so bad for the kids it's like you know they, they don't want to be in swim team but you're forcing them to and you're you're yelling at them if they don't win you know they're not first and and just putting so much pressure on them like god they're eight do they really need a personal trainer at eight I mean come on <laughs> let them be kids California yeah. is the worst I mean it's so competitive here for so many things I'm like let them be kids for a little bit let them figure themselves out not living you no know, not trying to realize all the dreams that you didn't in your childhood and uh well and i really what my focus is on being a parent that's awesome lots of, love. I, <laughs> lots of love i think that's awesome but you know too i was going to get your take on it seems like parents these days they don't want to ever see their kids fail and i was just curious i think failing sometimes is are some of the best lessons you could learn that everybody doesn't get a trophy and you know i was just curious your thoughts on that yeah the participation award for playing everyone gets a trophy i just don't get it i mean that's not life it's never has been life and it certainly wasn't when i grew up um you know i think my biggest lessons jay is it has been yours have been the, my biggest challenges and my biggest failures have taught me the most not the most successful things i've done it's been the hard times now and, you know, I meet with and, and try to mentor people that work in my office and watch people go through difficult challenges in life and give them the same message. I mean, this a challenging time or something you fail at is a great lesson. And it's going to be, you know, you can use it to, it really will define who you are as a person. And it's either going to bury you or you're going to, or it's going to make you. It just depends on what you want to make out of that situation. And I've been there lots of times in my life, whether it's been sports whether it's been in business, um, you know, coming out of Sitka and having to start all over again during the biggest economic crisis with a whole new business and business model. I mean, 
what do you do in that situation? You can go, you can quit and give up and say, well, I gave it a shot and that was it. Or you can learn from it and go, I'm going to get better and use it as a, uh, a, a motivation to, to be even more successful in the future. And, you know, it's, it's uh, you know, the fail is super important. I think it's the biggest lessons we learn. Yeah, I think you're spot on. Um, I really appreciate the time you spent with us today. I got one more question for sure. you. You were over in France when they had this latest terror attack, uh-huh. um, and I was just curious to get kind of the boots on the ground. You were yeah. pretty dang close to it. Uh, how, you know, did they lock down over there? What, you know, how did you first hear about it? Uh, you know, uh, yeah, just so it was, it, oh man, you know, we were really, I mean, probably really close to it. I mean, I was 15 minutes away from the event and we we're in the next town over in a place called Cannes that would happen to Nice and Cannes and Nice are like identical twins as far as the beach and how everything's set up and, um, you know, they did the big fireworks display at Cannes. It could have very easily been the, the, the town that we were staying in. And we were at dinner at a restaurant when it happened, and, and kind of word started spreading throughout the restaurant that something had happened. And we didn't really know what had happened. But before we went to dinner, I mean, the streets were shut off, and they were packed with people. I mean, the French love to celebrate anything, let alone their Independence Day. And they do a big fireworks display. And when we came out of the restaurant, the streets were empty. And we're like, where did all these people go? And we, we couldn't get a cab. We had to walk back to the hotel on empty streets during Bastille Day, which is the first time ever in France the streets are empty. We got back to the hotel and started getting information on what happened, and they had security at the front of the hotel. They had to check ID and passports and had to have a room key to get in. And then um, from that point on, it was the, the can emptied. I mean, the next day, everybody checked out. The streets were empty. The town was empty, of course, they're asking if we're leaving, and I'm like, no, we're not leaving. You know, there's no way I'm going to let somebody, a, a terrorist, affect my freedoms and what I want to be, you know, things we, we want to do. Um, but it was, honestly, it was really sobering. And to have it that close, um, an event certainly could have been the next town up and could have been right where we were, was really made you think. It really hit close to home, and it really pissed me off, quite honestly. I mean, it just, that terrorism just freaking angers me. And yeah. it's so cowardly, and the the kids and the people that this guy killed, I just it's so senseless. It just it just makes me so mad. Yeah, it's just horrible what's been going on, and that was another horrible tragedy. It's just uh, yeah, it's just mind mind blowing what's going on right now. Um, and I'm glad you it guys is. were okay. Um, soon as I saw it, I'm thinking, man, Jason and Brendan are right over there, right we next were. to this. Yeah, we were really close. It was really close. I mean, this world needs some leadership in a bad way, I'll tell you. Um, and uh, I'm just hoping we can do, you know, we can get active as a country and do something about this because uh, it's it's just gotten so out of hand. Yeah, and I, I, you know, I'm ready to get back to, you know, leaders that are patriotic and leaders that love the United States and love our history. And you know, I I, I just think some of that's been lost and. I think we need to get our priorities uh, back on track and, and uh, you know, the moral decay of the country. I just think there's a lot of issues going on and, uh, you know, we need to we need to buckle our chin strap and, and buckle down here because, uh, you know, there, it's uh, it's trying times well, for sure. I agree. So, and it needs to start. I mean, it's got to start from the top. And unfortunately, we've we've been led by somebody who isn't willing to take a stand on much and wants to try to make everybody happy. And you can't do that. I mean, you're never going to make everybody happy. You've got to take a stand for what's right and what our principles are as a country. And if you make some people, ha- you know, some people unhappy in that process, it's just the way it is. You can't make everybody happy and be and, and create something special. Yeah. It's kind of like, you know, some of the decisions you've had to make with Kuyu. Some of them have not been, uh, you know, totally popular, but it's for the best of to you and the bet you know it just we need a leader that's going to do some things that might not be 100 percent popular right now but it's for the best of the country and that's right um i, I hope we can i hope we can uh turn those tides so buddy it's been, it's been great having you on uh love following you on instagram i mean where Perfect. else can you get a, a president founder of a of a company 
as big as yours and daily posts on Instagram showing stuff, you know, from everything from going on at the company to, you know, personal hunts. I just uh, really commend you for uh, having that interaction uh, there Thanks. on your Instagram account. So it's easy when you yeah. love what you do, Jay, and you love your customers and you like to show off what's going on in your world. It's, it's fascinating. I mean, it's a, this whole thing's a dream come true for me and why not share it? Absolutely, buddy. Well, sounds good. Well, you and Brendan have a great time up there. I can't wait to see the photos and uh, can't wait to see the documentary um, and uh, just be safe and uh, shoot straight and, and uh, God bless Likewise. you guys and yeah. we'll see you when you get back and uh, I'll be going on an elk hunt myself and so hopefully I'll have some photos to share with you as well. Great. Well, I can't wait to hear how you do. And, uh, you know, again, good luck. And um, I know you'll hunt hard and do all the right things as far as I'm sure glad I'm not a big bull in your unit and you're not hunting me. <laughs> <laughs> well, all good right, luck. Buddy. And uh, I'll, yeah, I'll touch base when I get out. And, uh, yeah, you too. You be safe and, and shoot straight. I'll be all right, buddy. Safe. Take it's care. Always a pleasure to be on here. I love it. All right. Thanks. Bye-bye.